Good afternoon, I'm Ed Pazwoli, CEO of Trip Scott, and with us today is uh, one of my best friends and uh, CEO, President and CEO of CSUSA, uh, John Hage. John, welcome. Thanks, Ed. Good to be here. Hey, John, uh, during this COVID crisis, uh, how has CSUSA adapted its educational model for the benefit of its students? So radically. Um, obviously, everybody is online, and the seamless transition to virtual education for us has been um, one of the most inspiring things I've ever seen. So I have a big shout out to my teachers um, and to our students and the parents that have supported it. So it's really been exciting to see us transition to a virtual world and to do it really well and to make sure that every child in our, uh, in our system across the country, 70,000 plus of them are actually uh, flourishing. So given the troubles that some school districts have had with virtual learning. What has been uh, the switch over to remote or virtual learning? Uh, they've clearly had some trouble, but what, what is the key to your success compared to what we see on the public side? It starts with the idea that our teachers felt empowered, they were given tools, they were given professional development, and they were constantly involved. So I think it starts with the teacher having a commitment to ensuring that the child doesn't fall behind during these tough times and that they're there for them. Number two is it starts with families. Families choose our schools. They're schools of choice. So these are parents who already signed up and they knew what they were signing up for. They're, uh, they volunteer and put hours in and there's, and so now that same kind of committed parent and that committed teacher and educator together really makes the strong fabric. And then the last piece of that puzzle is the technology and the resources and the professional development and the the, the back end that we really provide at Charter School USA and with our partners that provides people with the sense that they can do this. So even if you're a teacher that's never done virtual education, uh, giving them the confidence and the training to do that really has made a difference. So with that said, so there are some silver linings that are coming out of this crisis uh, for your team and, and your group. Yeah, big ones. Uh, one is that we're learning that the future is not going to be uh, the way the past was and that everything is going to change. The question is, will change be for the good or will it be for, uh, for, you know, for bad? In other words, making sure that every child has access to good technology is part of that, especially kids that um, are from low-income families or might not have the same resources. So we've been focused on basically flipping the classroom so that the future is that a classroom comes to a student. So what does that look like? It looks like that a student wherever they are. Maybe they come to school next year for half a day or, and then the other half, the rest of the kids come and we split classrooms up or we make them small or we disperse. We do lots of things to meet the guidelines from the CDC and the government to ensure safety, but that means that also that that education in that classroom needs to go where that child is. So it might be at home now for partial, but it's still with their teacher. So now it's really made us, I think, in some ways better and focusing on how we could become a 21st century learning company. So over the short term, you have issues like, you know, what do you do with your high school graduates now with graduations? And then what do you do with potential offering up summer school opportunities for kids to stay engaged? And, and because some, some summer camps are going to be you know, not going to open this year. Right. How does that look for you on the short term? So we think over the summer it's going to be a blended approach. So uh, small group instruction, we're allowed and when safely at school. So we will be able to do that when the government gives us that permission to do so. We're prepared already. But a lot of it will be tutorial, giving kids, especially those who might have fallen behind a little bit during this instructional time, um, who didn't maybe learn as well through a virtual perspective, giving them some one-on-one -on -one tutorial. So we're focusing on that this summer. We're gonna be making sure that all the children that are under our care, all the students, are prepared for next school year. So we, you know, we don't wanna be like some of the systems that are around the country where they literally shut down early and they gave up and they just said it was too hard. We're gonna be in a place where those students are prepared for next school year. And whatever way that they come to school next year, sometimes it might be in person, sometimes it might be at home, it might be a blended approach, we're gonna have our entire educational model prepared for them starting now. And some of the extra anxiety that the COVID uh, crisis has caused, you know, with families being home and kids not being in a normal routine, Social emotional learning pieces. I know that you guys have worked hard on that. How do we deal with not only those the anxieties from this crisis, but the general social emotional learning environment? I don't think we've seen yet how bad some of the impact of this shutdown will 
have on the social emotional aspects of not just children but families. Uh, we see some of it starting to happen when you read uh, in the paper some divorce rates going up, some abuse going up, some depression going up. We think that the future is not just about getting back to really good math and science and reading, but also to build a system, and that's what we're focused on, which is uh, we're doing it through an attitude is altitude curriculum, working with a guy like Nick Wojcik, who's a world-renowned motivational speaker, he has no arms, no legs, and his life story is so impactful. So I think working in ways where students can see that life is more than just school, and obviously being stuck at home right now, that there is hope for the future, and that they need to have empathy and caring for others. There's a lot of people suffering during this time, and, and, and students need to understand how they can pay, play a role in helping make their family um, uh, stronger, but also how their community can be stronger um, after uh, COVID-19. So you see that as some of the silver line is coming out of this as well? I do, because let's just be honest, before this, uh, we were just kind of all on a rat wheel for, uh, and just moving fast. But all of a sudden, we now have some time from home and to view what the world is going through together and how are we going to respond to that. It's a great learning opportunity for families and students and kids to be a part of how can they make a difference in other people's lives. So we have uh, students right now who are doing cards and sending them to, uh, to nursing homes. We're doing things around um, reaching out to families who don't have a support system and how do you drop off food at their front door? How do you create ways in community? So I think the fabric of what we're doing is uh, it's going to get stronger because of this and what we're doing now and in the future. My commitment is to make sure that we don't lose that, that when COVID-19 is a year or two behind us and it will go away eventually, as it starts to go away, how do we keep the the parts that were actually the benefits from it, not just um, how to stay clean in our hands and how to make sure that we do good social thinking in the future, but really how do we keep a caring, committed uh, student um, and, and, and uh, workplace where people continue to be like that in the future and where giving back to your community is not something you have to do to get into college because it was part of your resume, it's because you really wanted to do something. You spent some time on the governor's uh, reopening committee uh, you're as a member and uh, talk a little bit about that experience and where you see the state going uh, now. So it was an honor. Um, I, I believe Governor DeSantis has done a very good job. Um, this is incredibly hard times. No one can, I think, second guess where leadership um, has been during this. He's followed data. We, we did that during the task force. We followed the data. Uh, we provided um, some of our own data. We um, were able to look at schools of choice around the state. People don't realize that over a million students attend some form of school of choice, whether it's a private school or a charter school or a scholarship school or even a virtual school. And those schools of choice, they have to be prepared for how do they reopen safely because they're not under that school district same standard. And so that's been an amazing opportunity for us to come up with some new ideas. Um, ideas around, for example, um, heat mapping so that if there's a student that might have a fever that we can identify that well before they even knew or someone else knows. Um, doing things around um, in the school itself, using um, distance differently, thinking about our environment, uh, physical environment. But really the big thinking is how do we flip the classroom? How do we make it so that a classroom is no longer just a physical place, but it's a learning opportunity like they do in many universities for wherever the student is, even if they're not in the classroom, they're still learning from the classroom. And so that's really what's going to be, I think, the opportunity out of this. Okay. Well, John, thank you so much for sharing your insights. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Ed.